Disclaimer The information, views, opinions and thoughts expressed in the readings are of the respective authors. We, the producer and reader, do not claim allegiance to them in any way. The content and references should be perceived keeping in mind the period when it was written and not according to the present context. The limited but sincere goal of this series is to offer the listener unedited and original content. Thank you. The Music Book Club presents Pillars of Hindustani Music by B. R. Devdhar Read by Anuradha Kubir Professor Giovanni Scrinzi At the music conference convened by the revered Pandit Vishnu Digambar in 1920, there was extended discussion on the subject of harmony. It is well known that in the West, it is universally believed that Indian music lacks in harmony. But during the conference I am talking about, numerous speakers vehemently propounded that harmony did exist in Indian music. The Bombay Press reproduced extracts from these speeches. The excerpts published in the Times of India came to the notice of Professor Scrinzi, who was a well-known composer, artist and art critic in Western music. He also happened to be the music critic of the Times at that time. In 1920-21, he wrote several articles in that paper on music. On reading the summary of the discussions on harmony, he wrote a letter to the Times of India which, to put it briefly, said as follows. Indian music and Western music are diverse systems built on fundamentally different foundations. There is some common ground between them in the sense that the two systems, since they both belong to the Aryan culture in their original or basic principles, show some resemblance. All the same, their later development has taken place on completely different lines. Indians would hardly tolerate criticism of their music by any European who had not studied their system in depth. Neither would we like Indians to pronounce a judgment on our music without complete familiarity with our music. We believe that what we understand by harmony, in the technical sense, does not exist in Indian music. But Indian musicologists insist that their music has harmony. There is only one way to resolve this controversial question and it is to pick up a student of music who is well acquainted with Indian music and teach him Western music. Someone who is well versed in both the systems and has had an opportunity to compare the two can authoritatively state whether there is harmony in Indian music. It is necessary to conduct such an experiment. I would like to offer a scholarship for this purpose to Gandharva Mahavidyale. If that institute finds a suitable student for the purpose, I am prepared to teach him Western music. He also wrote a letter to my Guruji, Pandit Vishnu Digambar, on similar lines. Panditji was always interested in such projects. Naturally, he was greatly pleased with Professor Scrinzi's proposal and lost no time in replying to him that he was accepting the scholarship offer with thanks and would write to him as soon as he found a suitable person for the project. There had been whisperings at the school about this exchange of letters, but since there were many persons in our college who were superior to me in terms of maturity, learning and achievement, I had dismissed myself as a serious candidate. What is more, Panditji had other plans for me. He had already selected me as a music teacher for a high school in Vasai. I was to leave for Vasai in the next two or three days. The night before I was to leave for taking up my new job, around 10.30 p.m., Panditji sent for me. When I went over to his quarters, I found him alone in a somewhat thoughtful mood. After a prolonged silence, he said, Devdhar, must you financially speaking leave the college right now and start earning? By way of reply, I said, No, sir, I have no dependence or anything like that. It is not as if I must take up a job as a matter of immediate necessity. He seemed pleased with my reply. After another longish interval of silence, he said, Devdhar, do not go on that Vasai job tomorrow. Your studies are still to be completed. 
a European music expert, has offered a scholarship to our school and he wants to teach Western music to one of the boys. After giving a great deal of thought to the matter, I have decided to select you for the purpose. But I was not sure whether you would prefer to study further or take up a job. Your answer is completely satisfactory. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., I want you here neatly and properly dressed. The European gentleman I told you about has agreed to visit us then and I want to introduce you to him. Your new studies will start after that. I was overjoyed to find that I had been selected for the project, although it was beyond my wildest expectations. The next evening, Professor Scrinzi duly turned up at the school and after a prolonged conversation between him and Panditji, I was sent for and introduced to the great man. It was decided that he would give me lessons on Tuesdays and Fridays from 6 to 7 p.m. Professor Scrinzi gave me a list of books recommended by the Trinity College of Music, London, for its curriculum. He asked me to buy the books before the next Friday. This is how my long association with Professor Scrinzi began. In India, we are used to daily lessons for every subject. And in our school too, at that time, classes were held daily. My instinct prompted me to question how much a student could possibly learn in the space of one or two hours a week. But my own experience later gave me the answer to this question. Professor Scrinzi turned up at our school precisely at 6 o'clock the following Friday and I had a chance to look him over closely. He was 6 feet tall and proportionately broad. He had the look of a serious-minded person and seemed a stern disciplinarian. We shook hands and took our seats. His first question was, uh, What is your name? As it was for the first time I was speaking to a prominent alien, I was somewhat flustered. I said uh, my name was Balakrishna Raghunath Devdhar. To that he responded, It is hardly practicable to call you by that enormous name. So tell me only your first name. I said, Balakrishna. He thought it over a little and said, I shall call you Krishna. He thus christened me Krishna and that is how he addressed me till the very end. I was in the matriculation class at that time, but I had left school along with many other students during the non-cooperation movement of 1920. I was not used to speaking in English, to add to which, there was the difficulty of following Professor Scrinzi's accent and pronunciation. Consequently, I felt greatly perturbed. A number of my colleagues at the school felt jealous of my nomination for the Western Music Project, which in turn bolstered my conceit. I began to study hard and do my homework punctiliously. Professor Scrinzi was greatly pleased that I had finished the first textbook in two months and gave a very complimentary report on me to Panditji. A beautiful piano was hired for me by Panditji at a rental of rupees 40 per month from S. Rose and Company. In addition to the theory of music, I could now also start practicing the art. The examinations of the Trinity College of London are held at selected centres all over the world. This premier institution has prescribed beautiful series of textbooks for every syllabus from the most elementary to the most advanced stages. My training was in accordance with the same set of syllabus. Before the beginning of the actual training, I was sceptical about learning very much in just two hours of training per week. The very first day, Professor Scrinzi said to me, The real work in the study of any subject, any art, has to be done by the student. The teacher is merely a guide. If you do not understand something, you are free to ask me to explain it to you a hundred times. It will never upset me. But I shall not tolerate your making errors in matters which you have fully grasped. We shall start with the first textbook today. It gives elementary information about music, definitions of technical terms and the key to the notation. Lesson number two and three are for you to read and understand. Once you have mastered the contents of the three lessons, you may turn to the appendix where you will find a number of questions based on each lesson. 
you have to answer those questions on music sheets on paper specially lined for writing staff notation i shall go through your answers the next time we meet your homework will tell me which rules you have grasped and which you have not i shall explain whatever you have failed to understand in those two lessons and also give you any supplementary information you need on the various points you will then have to redo all the questions and this time there must be no error you will also have to master lesson 4 and 5 at the time i adopted the practice of reading the appointed lessons 3 or 4 times noting down whatever struck me as important in a notebook reading the different portions again and again and then solving the relevant questions I spent only 2 hours every week with the professor but I found that even spending 2 hours daily on the homework was not sufficient to master the lessons. I used to read every small detail again and again and turn it over in my mind for hours before I felt that it had been firmly implanted in my mind. I have already mentioned that Pandit ji had hired a piano for me. Finally the day came when i was to receive my first lesson in piano playing i established myself in my seat well before 6 pm and started playing with the keys the sound that came forth was so delightful that i got completely absorbed in my playing i could play the harmonium fairly well and that was the fingering i used on the piano to produce indian classical music unknown to me Professor Sprinzy had entered the room and was quietly standing behind my stool. He noticed I was using only four fingers of each hand and was holding the little finger aloft. As soon as I sensed his presence, I stopped my playing and got up from my seat. "Why are you not using that little finger?" he asked. I said, "In playing Indian music on the harmonium, only four fingers are used and not the little finger." All our well-known harmonium players use four fingers for playing on the harmonium and hold aloft the little finger in exactly the same manner. Some players wear diamond rings on their little fingers and when the gems flash in the light during the playing that too comes in for admiration to a section of the audience. My witticism made him laugh. Thereafter he asked me to take my seat in front of the piano and resume my playing. While I played He felt both my arms which he found very hard and tense. He explained to me why that was an unscientific way of playing such an instrument. He said, "The shoulder, upper arm, the elbow and the wrist, all these must be in a naturally relaxed and supple state. Only then will you be able to put the necessary strength into your fingers and move them swiftly." Do you not think you're wasting energy when you flex your arms? All these limbs have to be strengthened by special exercises until they become fit for piano playing. He taught me the necessary exercises and I began to do them regularly every day. He demonstrated to my satisfaction that using all five fingers instead of only four was far more productive. My piano playing aroused his interest in our musical instruments and our manner of handling them. He attended some concerts of vocal and instrumental music too. The conclusion he finally reached was there is no doubt you have an art form of a very high quality but your technique of handling musical instruments can stand a lot of improvement. Many of your tabla, sarangi and sitar players play with such stiff arms and hands that much of their muscular energy is inevitably wasted their fingers consequently cannot move as fast as they should their entire arm moves along with the fingers having practiced for hours on end they succeed it is true in obtaining proficiency in playing their respective instruments but the strain they have to undergo while they play is clearly reflected on their faces the playing does not look particularly graceful young and educated people like you should interest themselves in these matters and find out through experimentation if this can be improved professor scrinzy's semi weekly lessons continued till 1922 when i left gandharva mahavidyalaya 
but our relationship continued to be close even after this. Whether because I had shown excellent progress or merely because he had become fond of me, I cannot say. The semi-weekly lessons continued now at Professor Scrinzi's Napian Sea Road residence. He allowed me to do my exercises on his piano. As appearances go, he seemed to be truculent, but he was really kind-hearted and witty. Consequently, I began to feel much more relaxed and free in his company. He had a large library comprising, apart from English books, French and Italian works. There were a number of books on Indian music. Seeing my interest in them, he asked me, What have you read so far on Indian music? Until he asked me that question, the only books we students had had to study were those published by Panditji for the prescribed syllabus of the college. The college library had a small collection of books, but since they were all in Sanskrit, I had not been able to read them. Pandit Bhatkande's books were not in our library. I had come across one of Captain D's books on music and I had read portions of that book. The library had an impressively long index, but many of the books mentioned therein were not to be found on the shelves. All this passed through my mind when Professor Scrinzi asked me that question. I said, I have not been able to get hold of very much to read on music. He was surprised at my answer. He said, You move about in society as a musical expert, Krishna, and you give tuitions in music, and you say you have not read any books on Indian music. What is the meaning of this? I responded to his question by describing to him the Indian music scene in general. I told him that the greatest emphasis in India was placed on the knowledge received directly from the Guru's mouth. We have to memorize every bandish he teaches. It is the Guru who tells us the rules which govern particular rags and we learn them in practice by trying to imitate the Guru as closely as we can. A large gap has developed between our contemporary music and the music of ancient times. Because of all these things, our artists have no occasion to study any books. Many of our most renowned artists can hardly sign their own names. All this was new to him. Having heard me out, he said, All that may be as you say, but you are making a comparative study of Indian and Western music. You at any rate must know what is said in the books. After this exchange, I began to read the books on music in his library. At times, he would pick up some subject as Shruti and ask me all manners of questions in order to understand precisely what it meant. On other occasions, he would ask me to sing an Indian song, take it down in staff and harmonize it and play it for me. To my ears, of course, the harmonized version always sounded like Western music. Three or four years after the end of World War I, celebrated opera companies, pianists and violinists from Europe began to visit India. Most of them were on the way to Europe, to Australia, but made it a point when they reached Bombay to stay on for a few days and give three or four presentations or recitals. Their favourite theatres were the Royal Opera House in Girgaon and Excelsior Theatre in Fort. In 1924, an Italian opera company was giving such performances at the Royal Opera House. Professor Scrinzi used to receive complimentary passes for these performances and very often he used to take me along with him. He used to tell me in advance the theme of the opera, the composer's name, and other details and explained to me any special features of the opera we were going to see. Since they were all Italian operas, that is, the words were Italian, I could not follow the theme. And as I knew very little about Western music, the musical numbers too made little impression on me. All my attention was centered on the orchestra. The company had an imposing bass singer who possessed a voice of such resonance breadth and power that the entire theatre used to overflow with the sound when he sang. The volume of his voice 
was large enough to drown the entire twenty-piece orchestra. The final note of his aria was delivered vibrato in such a manner that the whole theatre appeared to be vibrating with it. But the same voice could assume a velvety softness whenever he turned to a love song. After the end of one such performance, I said to Professor Scrinzi, Every singer in this company has a seasoned, powerful and sweet voice. They have to use their voices continuously for four or five hours during each performance. But I don't see anyone humming or hawing or clearing his voice. Their voices never seem to tire. How do they manage all this? Professor Scrinzi replied, I am glad you raised this question, Krishna. From next Sunday, I will start giving you an idea about our vocal training. Your music is completely different from ours, so everything I say may not be of much value to you, but I am sure you will find some of the things useful. From the following Sunday, Professor Scrinzi started giving me lessons in voice training. He struck a certain key on the piano and directed me to reproduce that note. My attempt to produce a continuous note of that pitch did not satisfy him. He stood up and asked me to try again. His comment was, Your voice sounds throaty and wooden. Following his instructions, I repeated the performance after removing my shirt. He said my breathing was all wrong and singers must learn how to breathe scientifically. He held a mirror in front of me and convinced me that I was raising my collarbones in singing. Because during inhalation, I was mainly using the uppermost portion, apex of my lungs. He called it collarbone breathing. Then he demonstrated to me the correct method of breathing. When one inhales in the prescribed manner, the breath is held in the lower, broader portion of the lungs. As the lungs fill with air, they begin to press on the rib cage and diaphragm, causing the latter to be depressed. The lower part of the thorax is thereby enlarged. The professor noticed that I did not open my mouth in the correct way. He taught me exactly how and to what extent I must open my mouth. He demonstrated how the shape of the mouth must change when one produces each vowel sound such as A, E, I, O and U and how the hollow space inside the mouth must be used if the tone of each vowel is to sound musical. He also explained to me the important part played by the soft and the hard palate in voice production. The only way of learning the scientific method of breathing is to make one's natural breathing confirm to that method. I could tell from my own experience that our music teachers did not pay much attention to voice culture. No one ever gives much attention to the importance of correct breathing. Every guru tells you to increase the lung capacity, but he cannot tell you how to do it. Whenever he taught, Panditji did pay attention to this matter, but his criticism was confined to and directed against superficialities such as making weird faces while singing, wild movements of the chin, nasal tone, etc. He also told us repeatedly how essential it was for a singer to have adequate lung capacity. Even our illiterate musicians were apparently aware of this. A Sarangi player of my acquaintance had trained his son to be a vocal musician and had invited me to listen to him. The boy had a good voice and the father had made him learn a number of taans by heart. The boy started going through his repertoire of marathon taans but at one point he had to break away because of shortness of breath before reaching the sum so that he was unable to land on the sum in an orderly manner. The Sarangi player there and then began to rain a barrage of blows on the boy with his bow, saying, It would not matter if it kills you but complete the taan, come to the sum and then die. Do not die in the middle of the taan. The boy was only 9 or 10 years old and his lung capacity had yet to develop to the point where he could do what was expected of him. I was convinced by the incident 
that systematic training in voice production would greatly help to make the voice more powerful. One day I suggested to the professor that he should listen to some of our reputed singers and tell me what he thought of their voices. Consequently, he attended several mehfils in my company but was not particularly pleased with anyone's voice. He called some voices wooden, lacking in resonance and some others artificial. He would analyze every voice and unerringly pinpoint the faults he noticed. One day he heard Panditji sing and that was one occasion when he was truly pleased. He said, this is the first singer whose voice pleases me. It is completely flawless. He was always puzzled by the fact that we admired very high metallic voices. What he admired in a voice was denseness, depth and fullness. He was baffled by our almost complete indifference to voice culture. Bombay in those days had a number of Western musicians, singers as well as instrument players. Western music enjoyed great popularity in the affluent Parsi community and through the initiative of some wealthy members of the community, an institution called Bombay Symphony Orchestra had just been established in the city. The conductor was a German gentleman called Herr Bear. The concerts were usually held at the Kawasdi Jahangir Hall and sometimes in the Excelsior Theatre. The immortal works of great composers like Gibi Thawen, Brahm, Chopin, Bach, etc. used to be presented at these concerts. Naturally, everyone who attended the concerts was not a connoisseur. There were those who were blind imitators of the Europeans, did not know anything about Western music and had come because it was the smart thing to do and faithfully joined the others in clapping after each number was over. On occasions, Professor Scrinzi used to give piano recitals in these concerts, but he would limit those recitals to one or two in a year. The date of his program was usually decided some five or six months in advance. Once the details of his forthcoming recitals were fixed, his arduous preparations would begin. During the first two or three months, he would spend a minimum of two hours daily four to five hours on Sunday, playing on the piano. Since by now, our relationship had assumed a close informality and I had become a frequent visitor to his house, I could watch everything from very close quarters. About a month or two before the date of the recital, he would temporarily stop his two or three tuitions and devote the entire time to his workout on the piano. Every Sunday morning around 9 or 10 o'clock, I would present myself at his house, stand by his side while he played on the piano and turn the pages of his music book whenever he gave me the signal. His workout would continue till noon, after which we would chat. One day I asked him, The music you propose to play this time must have been played by you hundreds of times. You may have taught it to your pupils also. Why then is it necessary to work so hard on it? He replied, Giving a recital is a sort of rigorous test. The artist's entire reputation depends on that. If my playing falls short of people's expectations, I am doomed to eternity. Professionally too, it would be disastrous for me. That is why all this torture. I must feel satisfied that I have done my best. My next question was, you play whatever the composer has written. The entire music is before you. When your own contribution to the whole thing is nil or minimal, what does all this effort achieve? He laughed at my question and said, I have acquired some knowledge about your music and have also attended some mehfuls in your company. In Indian music too, the notes of every rag are predetermined and the singer has to make combinations of the permitted notes on the spot and sing. Your singers are required to preserve the atmosphere and the mood of that particular rag. Our music deals with the definite subject, a certain theme, and it has to be recreated in entirety without omitting the smallest detail. Let me try to clear your mind by asking you a question. See, a playwright writes a play. 
The play has a story to tell and a number of characters, each one of whom has his own lines to say. And all this has been written down by the dramatist in words appropriate to the theme in question. The actors do not have to say anything of their own. Suppose for a moment that the actors learn their parts by heart and deliver their lines faithfully but like a recitation before the audience. Would you consider such a play as well presented? I said, certainly not. If the mood and the motivation which prompted the playwright to write these lines are not brought alive by the actors on the stage, the play cannot succeed. Our top actors are constantly trying to make their character portrayal more effective. That is indeed the secret of their success. The professor said, All right then, mere mechanical repetition of the lines in a play will not make it successful. In exactly the same way, it is not sufficient to play the music before yourself and reproduce every note therein faithfully on the piano. Our composers make a close observation of this life of the world around them. Something that they notice makes such a deep impression on them that they are inspired to create an artistic musical piece. Once the arrangement and the outlines of what a composer wants to say are clear in his mind, he tries to select notes which will reflect effectively the emotions in his mind. External happenings like a storm at sea, torrential rains, railway accidents or introspective themes such as the emotions of love or changing moods, any such subject can trigger the composer's inspiration. A composer could even derive inspiration from a subject like the atrocious conditions of unskilled laborers for an artistic musical creation. He may create the whole ugly world of laborers before him by a mere arrangement of notes. So much for the composer. We artists actually play what the composer has written and try to recreate the thoughts and emotions of that particular composer as realistically and competently as possible. Those alone who succeed in doing this enjoy renown. Thereafter, he would explain the theme, sub-themes and finer points of the piece he happened to be working on and play selected portions for me. Having left school during the non-cooperation movement of 1921, I could not appear for the matriculation exam. I passed another barren year. I got through the first four examinations of Trinity College of Music London and the professor was preparing me for the last, higher local examination of that college. Only those who passed the matriculation stage could appear for this last examination. In order to remove this disability, I resumed my studies for the matriculation and passed it in 1923. After I had passed the matriculation examination, I began to be noticed by various prominent persons during their visit to the Gandharva Mahavidyale. Many of these people would invite me to their homes. Their advice invariably was that I should go up to college. Devdhar, they would say, we were glad to learn that you had become a matriculate. There are almost no educated people in your field. That is why you must now go to college and become a Bachelor of Arts. In society, as well as in the world of music, you will become a highly respected person. In the days I am talking about, among educated sections of society, even the most famous musicians were categorized as uneducated and treated with scant courtesy. Although, of course, it was perfectly respectable to go to concerts of vocal or instrumental music. I was influenced by all these considerations when I decided to become a graduate. I also called on our Guruji Pandit Vishnu Digambar and told him that I had passed the matriculation. He was delighted. I also told him about my plans to work for my BA degree and asked for his blessings. He was overjoyed to hear this. He said, Devdhar, no matter how difficult it turns out to be, do not ever give up your decision to become a graduate. I am aware that it will not be easy to continue music tuitions and also work for your degree. But you have been brought up in my discipline. 
you have witnessed all the struggle our college has had to face and you know how i have overcome all these obstacles without moving an inch from my ideals there are very few educated people in the world of music if one of my disciples becomes a graduate it will be a matter of personal pride for me i give you all my blessings but please do not take up the job of a clerk or a school teacher after graduation remember that i shall feel proud of you only if as a bachelor of arts you retain your interest in music and continue to work in this field i was glad that pandit ji approved my plan to do ba until about june 10 of 1923 i did not get an opportunity to talk these things to professor skrinzi at all in the meanwhile i applied for admission to saint xavier's college just around that time one sunday morning professor skrinzi said to me krishna you are a matriculate now and you do not have to worry about academic studies you must now devote at least 3 to 4 hours daily to the study of western music besides that you have to continue the study of indian music as well because of your deep involvement in indian music it has been difficult for you to understand harmony and counterpoint which are both fundamental to an understanding of western music you will therefore have to spend more time than other students on these subjects you do not have a piano so you may use mine for practice but you must practice regularly and for at least 2 hours daily i am usually out afternoons you can use the piano then i was flabbergasted by what he said with much trepidation i replied i have decided to join college and do my ba the idea did not appeal to him at all in his view one lifetime was not enough for a person to understand a single system of music i had taken up the study of not one but two music systems his deepest conviction was that from then on i should confine my studies to music he was greatly annoyed with me he told me to consider the matter from every angle and see him again after 2 days i gave the matter a great deal of thought but the prospect of becoming a ba was much too tempting my mind was finally made up when i saw him again in 2 days time he said you are a european university degrees as such do not count for much with you anyone who is an expert in his field may be a cobbler or a cook or a musician is honored by society but i am an indian it is here that my sphere of activity lies in our country education counts for a great deal at least as things stand a man's worth is rated on the university degree he has acquired in our field of music there are no educated people and accordingly musicians are not greatly respected expert singers and instrument players too have no place in educated society those who fancy music go to concerts vocal and instrumental even applaud the artists but they will not mix with the musicians socially that is why if i become a graduate and continue to work in this field i shall earn respect not only for myself but for our art as well i know you are against my joining college but i hope you will permit me to do this having regard to the state of art and public opinion in our country he ruminated over my abject plea for a few moments he said i am afraid nothing you say will make me change my mind you will waste four valuable years of your life studying all manners of irrelevant subjects but remain a complete ignoramus as far as music is concerned but as i am a foreigner i do not know what is regarded as respectable by your society and what is not go to college if you are so determined we too have an honest difference of opinion on this point a difference of opinion is not a quarrel so let us agree not to bring up this controversial subject again i am permitting you to join college with reluctance about a week later he took me to saint xavier's college and introduced me to the principal father blatter he said to father blatter here is an intelligent young man he is studying the western music with me 
He has also studied Indian music and gives music tuitions by which he intends to earn enough to be able to finance his education himself. He thinks that it is more important for him to become a BA than to pursue his musical studies. Whatever that may be, because I have a special regard for him, I am surrendering him as a friend to your care. Please keep an eye on him and help him in any way you can. After this introduction, Father Blatter voluntarily pacified Professor Scrinzi by telling him how highly university degrees were regarded in India. He confirmed what I had said, namely that a degree would help me become a respected figure even in the world of music. Throughout my years in St. Xavier's, Father Blatter helped me in every way. My study of Western music continued side by side with my college education. On the piano, I could do all the elementary exercises proficiently. But later, when I had to play one set of notes with the left hand and another with the right and do all this simultaneously, I began to find it difficult to move both hands smoothly at the same time. In playing Indian music on the harmonium, the use of both hands involves playing the same notes with both hands. I could do that quite well. This was different. But with tremendous effort, I learned to play half a dozen pieces of elementary music. But later, when it came to triads, that is, depressing three keys simultaneously with both hands, all progress came to a dead stop. I could not identify in my mind the three notes such as C, E, G and C, B, D, etc. being played simultaneously. I could identify a single note or a series of singles played one after the other immediately. This simultaneous playing of three or more notes is the foundation of harmony. Melody is defined as a succession of single sounds whereas Harmony means several notes sounding together and the science of combining them. It will be clear now that the word harmony does not stand merely for something that is pleasing to the ear. It means something much deeper and distinctive. Since my musical education and my whole environment continued to be purely Indian, I could deal with the succession of single sounds beautifully but a simultaneous sounding of two or three notes confused me. A doubt may arise in the reader's mind how a singer, or for that matter an instrument like the violin, can produce two or three notes simultaneously. This is a pertinent question. The singer can produce only one note at a time. Hence, he produces melody. But the person who accompanies the singer on the piano does not play the notes the singer produces. He plays a different set of notes which relate to or harmonize with what he is singing. The same goes for the violin. In our music, a violin player, as a lone performer on the stage, plays melodic music to the accompaniment of a tabla player, percussionist. In Western music, a violin solo must have piano accompaniment and the piano player does not reproduce the melody being played on the violin, but plays music which harmonizes with it and gives it depth. Renowned Western violinists like Heifzit and Chrysler must have a piano to accompany them when they play. Instruments like the piano, harp or, or organ can be played without other accompaniment. The same applies to their orchestras. Numerous instruments are played together. Out of these, instruments like the violin play the dominant melody or tune, while other groups of instruments play music which harmonizes with that melody. Sometimes the melody part is played by the instruments like the clarinet, while other instruments provide the harmony accompaniment. All instruments continue to produce music which is pleasing to the ear. Harmony means music which has been composed to give substance and beauty to the principal melody or theme. Harmony implies the employment of triads, that is sets of three or more notes. Study of Western music means learning the rules of harmony and the science of composition. There are definite rules which tell you how to arrange three notes 
so that they will sound pleasing these are called laws of harmony as my studies progressed the professor started teaching me these laws in order to find out whether i had understood the laws he began to give me a new series of notes to harmonize every day by way of a test i devised a method for accomplishing this i would first note down a triad which would go with the first note of the series then read up the laws of harmony and having taken into account the frequency differences between the initial note and the notes that followed write down the triad for these notes and then harmonize the series but i did not have the ear for the simultaneous perception of the original notes and their blending with the relevant harmony this used to make professor scrinzy angry he would say you're working mechanically you don't feel the sound of notes you write that was true but what could i do i had not been trained from the beginning to hear and recognize three or four notes simultaneously how could i now suddenly start doing what the professor wanted me to do the path ahead proved even more difficult and i found myself moving at a snail's pace i felt thoroughly discouraged i found i was making no improvement in my piano playing and in theory too all progress seemed to be coming to a halt the feeling that since i was incapable of proceeding beyond a point and that professor scrinzy could not take his experiment to conclusion with my participation saddened me greatly one day i had a frank talk with the professor on this subject and towards the beginning of 1925 my study of western music came to an end i can say from my own experience that those who want to learn western music should start it before they have learned indian music it is possible to learn if one starts it at a fairly early age and before one has been deeply influenced by indian music the experiment in which i had taken part arose from the controversy concerning the existence or otherwise of harmony in indian music it is quite true that my study of the western system was sufficient to enable me to answer this question i can definitely assert that there is no harmony in our music our music is purely melodic although my music lessons ceased my social relationship with the professor remained unbroken most sundays i went to see him at his home we would discuss all manners of things one sunday he gave me a list of a dozen books on higher mathematics and asked me to fetch the books from the saint xavier's library i duly borrowed them and handed over the lot to him he returned them to me after a fortnight and asked me to take them back to the library he looked rather stern but was really a very pleasant and witty person i used to ask him numerous questions including i should think some childish ones but i never saw him react irritably he would instead come out with retorts which were so humorous that i could not control my laughter on the present occasion i asked him how could you have finished all these books in such a short time let me see some notebooks or sheets on which you have solved some of the problems in the books my audacity did not seem to anger him he quietly told me to go to the next room and fetch some of the crumpled sheets from the waste paper basket under his desk when i went to the room he had indicated i found a basket overflowing with sheets which he had used for solving the mathematical problems thereupon i asked him if you are so good in mathematics why did you not become a professor of maths he said krishna that indeed was my ambition i had taken a dcs in two subjects mathematics and physics at the university of naples but fate had something else in store for me i was to come to india and become a music teacher by profession i was in the intermediate science class at the time and i had also taken mathematics i began to take my difficulties in that subject to him at times and he would promptly show me how to solve them one day i was helping him to clean up and rearrange his library suddenly i came across two fat notebooks the handwriting i saw in the notebooks was so beautiful that at first sight i thought it was printed matter but on a closer look i was convinced that it was all handwritten 
The text was Italian, but there were many numerals and mathematical formulae. Professor Scrinzi took the notebook from me and said, If you happen to know any intelligent teacher of mathematics, I should like to be introduced to him. I love mathematics. I was engaged on some research in that subject. It is all written down here. I have kept these notebooks with me all through these years in the hope that one day I would have enough leisure to return to this work and complete it. But I am getting old now and with my tuitions etc. I am most unlikely to be able to do this work. But if I can explain what I am trying to do to a mathematician, he may be able to complete what I started. I questioned him often about his early life. But he always parried my questions by saying, Krishna, there is nothing to interest you in the early life of an unfortunate person like me. You are young. You live in a different world. So please, do not press me to reveal my past to you. By now, I was in the intermediate class, but my music tuitions did not allow me to attend to my practices regularly. Moreover, I had also started my own music school. I spent two years in the intermediate class, but each time, I could not appear for the inter-science examination as my preparation had not been adequate. Consequently, I was feeling thoroughly wretched and despondent. While in that state of mind, I happened to call on Professor Scrinzi one evening. He sensed my despondency and asked me what my trouble was. I said, I am fed up with my life. It is better to commit suicide than to go on living like this. He did not say anything very much then merely asked me to stay for dinner. After dinner, he invited me to take a walk with him. He did not start prodding the affair until we had taken our seats on a bench at Chapati. I told him about my troubles. It is difficult to earn enough for one's needs by doing music tuitions. Lucrative tuitions are rare. If one wants to try something new, it is difficult to get the public on one's side. I also find it difficult to attend college classes and practicals regularly. All in all, I am beginning to think my ambition to become a graduate will remain a dream, etc. etc. Professor Scrinzi had always opposed my plan to go to college, but once I had taken the decision, he did not say a word about it. After patiently listening to my tale of woe, he said, Krishna, you are a Hindu and your religion tells you that everyone reaps in this birth, the fruit of whatever good or bad deeds he has done in his previous birth. Man cannot escape his karma by committing suicide. His predetermined suffering would be transferred from this birth to the next one. That is all. But one cannot escape the sufferings altogether. So, drive out all cowardly thoughts from your mind and suffer what you must in this birth. Get done with it once and for all. You are my student, so do not allow such unmanly thoughts to enter your head. You often asked me about my early life and I avoided telling it to you each time. Today I propose to tell you about my trials and tribulations and how I overcame them. It might show you the way. The account he gave me was as follows. Professor Scrinzi came from a place called Verona in Italy. His father belonged to a wealthy family and was the director of the town's bank. Consequently, he had a very happy childhood. Because he had, even as a child, shown interest in music, expert music teachers were appointed to teach him music. He had made very good progress in vocal and piano playing and even won several prizes. But he had no inkling in those years that he was destined to live the life of a music teacher. His parents, like any others, wanted him to become well-qualified and successful in some profession. He was always at the top of his class and after he had passed the entrance exam, he was sent up to Naples University for higher education. At the university too, he was the recipient of many scholarships and prizes and obtained a doctorate in mathematics and physics. In Italy, military training was compulsory for everyone at that time. Accordingly, after leaving university, he joined the army. Having come from an influential family, he became a commissioned officer and also started getting a salary. He must have been about 20 or 22 years old then. Life until then had been an unending bliss. Because of his family's wealth, he could indulge his smallest wish and there was nothing lacking. 
on termination of his military training he was planning to take a professor's job somewhere and engage in research but fate had other things in store for him professor scrinzy had an older brother who like him was highly intelligent he was also proficient in many european languages in the company of friends of an unsavory character the professor's brother became a gambler he began to visit casinos at monte carlo and elsewhere and ran up debts which their father was forced to repay this led to frequent and violent quarrels between father and mother the former a disciplinarian and the latter over indulgent towards her son professor scrinzy was undergoing compulsory military training at that time one day there was another quarrel between the parents over the doings of the eldest son but a quarrel so violent that the father left the house his parting words were that he had not earned his money for his sons to squander away and that he meant to spend whatever had remained as he pleased then they that is the wife and his erring son would realize the value of money shortly after this incident the father died the family to their horror discovered that true to his word the father had not left a single cent for them in the meanwhile the older son had already left his home in a huff the mother suddenly found herself immersed in stark poverty and loneliness she was completely nonplussed professor scrinzy was not very well paid but by cutting down his own needs to the very bone he began to support his mother in the meantime the older brother's wanderings had brought him to india where for a few days he eked out a living by giving tuitions in european languages but after a few days being highly intelligent he succeeded in joining the belgium consulate in bombay as secretary to the council he was in india when the news of his father's death reached him he was well aware that he was responsible for all the disasters which had befallen his family and wanted to make amends he wrote to his mother and younger brother and advised them to join him in india he also sent them enough money to cover their fares he argued in his letter that as there was now no influential person to back his younger brother he was not likely to be able to secure a well paid job as there were no good musicians in india his profound knowledge of music would enable him to earn a sufficient amount by becoming a music teacher on termination of his military training for want of anything better to do professor scrinzy with his mother in tow arrived in india in 1889 before embarking for india he only knew italian and french but started teaching himself english on shipboard later he became proficient in english and also wrote some poems in that language on reaching bombay the family took rented accommodation in the suburbs conditions were pretty bad professor scrinzy had no money and no friends or acquaintances for several months the trio had to subsist on whatever little the older brother earned the mother was very hard working and did all the housework she had had a good upbringing and among her accomplishments was one lace making which now stood her in good stead her work had been exhibited and she had received prizes for the excellence of her work the word soon got around about her skill in that particular craft a number of parsi women started taking lessons from her in lace making and her own finished products were soon in demand as for professor scrinzy once having decided to make a career in the field of music he left everything else aside and concentrated on piano practice and the study of english the whole day was spent in the pursuit of those two subjects at least during the initial 3 or 4 months thereafter he was fortunate enough to secure one music tuition professor scrinzy's condition at that time is best described in his own words i had only one reasonably good suit which i would wear when i went for my tuition the distance to the pupil's home was 2 miles which i had to inevitably cover on foot during the rains the suit got a thorough soaking and liberal splattering of mud on the returning home i used to hand the suit over to my mother for cleaning she used to wash away the stains at night hang it for drying and iron it in the morning so i would wear it to the tuition the next afternoon i knew 
that a professional music teacher could not not afford to be decently dressed he had also to be gentlemanly in his behavior and should show deep concern and friendliness towards his pupils these things are like an art teacher's capital so i was especially keen on presenting the right image my earnings from this first tuition amounted to only rupees 40 per month but that did not prevent me from giving of my best i had to my first pupil it worked because this boy passed the word around in his circle of friends and relations and i secured many other tuitions through him it took professor scrinzi about a year to feel reasonably well settled in bombay and during the next 7 or 8 years he had a modest saving also to his credit in between his elder brother died professor scrinzi began to feel nostalgic about the old country he thought he would be able to make a home for himself as a professional musician in his home country accordingly he and his mother went back to italy before long he began to do well in his profession and his reputation spread but an unexpected difficulty cropped up his mother now a woman of advanced age began to find the climate of her mother country too harsh perhaps because her 10 years stay in a warm country like india she was frequently ill and her doctors finally advised professor scrinzi that a milder climate would suit her better The dutiful professor was forced to abandon his plan to settle down in his beloved Italy and migrated to Egypt. He had no difficulty in establishing himself professionally there, but the country bored him. He could not help thinking that if he was destined to live the life of an exile, he would be much better off in India, where he had lived for over 10 years. The professor's mother was of the same view. and son and mother once again returned to indian shores old acquaintances were renewed and things soon began to run smoothly for them during the second visit he became truly famous and succeeded in getting tuitions with many wealthy parsi families professor scrinzi's mother died in early 1921 it was the free ship started in her name that i had succeeded in getting the professor had no vices His pupils used to give him numerous bottles of high quality expensive liquor which he habitually stored in a cupboard to be opened and used at a banquet every Christmas to which he invited all his friends. He remained a bachelor to the end. He was the acknowledged leader of the Italian community in Bombay. At the time of the First World War, he repeatedly applied through the Italian embassy for enlistment in the Italian army. but his request was turned down every time as he was over 50 by then when i left for europe in 1933 i carried with me an invitation to the world music conference at florence italy which he had contrived to obtain for me the italian consul had made the following note on my passport mr devdhar is an authorized representative of india this proved to be most useful to me The customs in every country seeing the Italian consul's remark always passed my baggage with only a cursory examination and in Italy seeing the note they did not even bother to examine anything instead they respectfully saluted me after visiting Italy and Austria I traveled to Prague in Czechoslovakia an internationally known musician called Dr Alice Haba lived there at that time I received a most courteous invitation from him to visit his home. He was well aware that in Indian music we used shrutis that is quarter tones. As a matter of fact, Dr. Haba had constructed a piano with quarter tones which he showed me. He asked me numerous questions about the use of shrutis in Indian music. I gave a detailed account of my talk with Dr. Haba to Professor Scrinzi. I happen to have with me the reply received from the professor to my letter which I am reproducing below. Dadisat Road, Chopati, 5th August 1933. Dear Krishna, I am glad that you found your voyage to Europe not only pleasant but remunerative. You must have realized what a live thing music is in Europe. Perhaps you will now understand how much out of place I feel in Bombay. I shall be glad to hear on your return the construction of the quarter tone piano. I am aware of several experiments concerning piano, but so far they seem to have been failures. Considering extent 
and complications of the usual keyboard i don't see of what use a quarter tone piano can be to play modern music on the usual piano is already next to impossible do write to me from paris i want to hear how you have been received by mademoiselle philippe he is a very charming man and a great master of technique yours sincerely g scrinzi continued visiting him as before after returning from europe we would talk for hours about the culture of europe and the world of european music he had kidney trouble towards the end of may 1935 he fell ill because of the same malfunctioning organ and was removed according to his wishes to st george's hospital there on june 3rd he died aged probably 70 his pupils were mainly parsi women a few europeans and indian christians also went to him to learn music from amongst his better known students mrs bhikaji palamkot one of his earliest pupils later started a music school of her own she was very widely known in the parsi community also to be rated among his more famous pupils were the illustrious karsetji wadia and his two daughters wadia was a renowned composer and some of his works were broadcasted by bbc london the event was well talked about in the indian press at that time the elder daughter hila is a reputed singer and has sung in a number of music concerts of european music the younger daughter is a highly skilled pianist who has won recognition in europe the wadias belong to a very old wealthy family deeply attached to music professor scrinzi also used to call regularly at the residence of justice koyaji of the bombay high court to teach music professor scrinzi himself was a top quality composer he composed a few works on the basis of indian scales i have heard one of these clouds numerous times well known european firm of music publishers recordy limited has published some of professor scrinzi's compositions the times of india paid homage to the great man by writing a special article on the occasion of his death there must be very few who remember him today unless they happen to be his students i for one can never forget him or the numerous valuable things i learned from him my river teacher pandit vishnu digambar passed away in 1931 professor scrinzi died in 1935 and the following year pandit v n bhatkhandi i did not receive much musical training as such from pandit vishnu digambar but i had the good fortune to be close to him for over 4 years during which time i picked up many useful things from him deep devotion to teachers organizational ability neatness punctuality idealism industry pandit ji possessed all these qualities in ample measure professor scrinzi taught me where and how to seek knowledge and how to gather information and present it systematically knowledge is not stored in a single individual or gharana but as professor scrinzi pointed out it must be gleaned from numerous sources including rare books and learned persons once my vision was cleared in this manner i could see for myself the importance of pandit bhatkhande's works and the dedicated efforts which lay behind them paying homage to these three great men i feel that at least a fragment of the debt owed to them has been repaid